So Street Fighter as a game comes from a sort of long line of um, fictional works that, that, that deal with self-actualization through adversity, through fighting. I mean, it's basically about a guy fighting a bunch of other guys to be better than he was, or than he is, or than he could be. Um, which you can see by me uh, there reducing the uh, difficulty um, because obviously uh, there's no point in being that much better than other people. Um, yeah, so one of the things that Street Fighter does is is it, it shows a person in adversity uh, getting better. I'm going to go with Ryu in this playthrough because Ryu is the most, I think for me he's the most kind of virginal, the most um, sort of blank slate. He wants to be better, he just, he, he just doesn't have as much personality as the others, um, but also that you know, he's um, also, he fits in uh, with what um, part of the history of um, fighting games is uh, the whole Bruce Lee thing um, uh, and that whole idea, the, the game of death, the whole idea of um, fighting through various stages of things in order to become better uh, and also redeem yourself in order to um, find something uh, that is missing um, from your life. Um, that whole idea of things has uh, a really quite ancient um, sort of pedigree. Uh, so what I also want to talk about then is is part of that pedigree is the um, Sort of Middle English poem, um, sort of very, uh, it's sort of beginning age of Christendom in England, um, uh, of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Um, this is a poem about um, uh, the Green Knight comes to Camelot at Christmas and challenges um, everyone there, and Gawain steps up for the challenge, and um, Gawain uh, is told he's got one chance to kill the Green Knight if he kills if um, and then the Green Knight will return that blow and he thinks this is great I can kill the Green Knight that's that's no problem uh, he chops the guy's head off and then uh, the Green Knight says right cool in a year's time uh, I get to do the same to you and suddenly he's got a clock running um, and Gawain is your very archetypal um, uh, you know he's, he's virginal he's pure He's sort of almost sexless, and he wants to. He's um, Arthur's cousin, and uh, he just wants to prove himself. Um, and so, what happens in the in the course of the of the poem is, um, like Bruce Lee, uh, Gawain um, goes on a journey uh, through England. So, you know, obviously in this. Uh, video here you're watching Ryu go on a journey through the world but you know at, at this point in time when these people were writing England was very much if not the world I mean obviously it starts off talking about the, the siege of Troy they you know they didn't know about um, the rest of the world but 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 England is Avalon it's it is this kind of encompassing area um, so He's, um, you know, he goes off, he fights, um, he, ha he, he has all these various troubles, um, he, he, where he has to deal with, um, you know, external things, as, uh, Ryo does, but also he has to deal with himself, um, which is what happens in Street Fighter, because obviously you have to fight yourself at one point, and, um, also the environment, um, which in Street Fighter is represented by cars and, uh, piles of bricks, but in uh, Gawain the Green Knight uh, is represented by um, just the landscape that he travels through and, and you get that a lot in these kind of um, adversarial uh, narratives um, of this landscape that you have to travel through. Uh, but the bit of the, the poem that I'm going to read in a second um, is 
specifically, uh, so he's met, um, uh, that he's got to the, um, court of another knight, uh, and it's almost New Year, so he knows that he's in the right part of the country to face the Green Knight, but he, he's been given some, some rest and respite by this, uh, by this knight, um, and, you know, before he goes out to, to defeat the Green Knight, um, the, the other knight, uh, offers Gawain a wager, and he says, um, I I'll go out hunting for three nights, um, and you stay at home, and whatever we win, while during the day, uh, we will give to each other in the evening. And this is where, sort of the crux of, for me, the crux of the poem, it's where, um, Gawain has to sort of really um, come to terms with himself uh, and who he is and um, what it is that he, you know, the, the the sort of the threat of the Green Knight is is sort of quite abstracted. It's 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 the threat of death um, and the threat of failure. Um, and also the threat of going against your word, but but suddenly Gawain has to deal with some actual real life things. Um, so, you know, this is uh, this is the beginning of Fit Three. I'm reading Simon Armitage's uh, translation um, of uh, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Well before sunrise, the servants were stirring. The guests who were going had called for their grooms, and they scurried to the stables to ready the steeds, trussing and tying all the trammel and track. The highest-ranking nobles got ready to ride, jumped stylishly to their saddles and seized the reins, then cantered away on their chosen courses. The lord of that land was by no means last. To be rigged out for riding with the rest of his men, after mass he wolfed down a meal and made for the hunting grounds with his hunting horn, so as morning was lifting his lamp to the land, his lordship and his huntsmen were high on horseback. And the canny kennel men had coupled the hounds and opened the cages and called them out. On the bugles they blew three bellowing notes to a din of baying and barking, and the dogs which chased or wandered were chastened by whip, as I heard it were talking a hundred top hunters, at least. The handlers hold their hounds, the huntsman's hounds run free, each bugle blast rebounds between the trunks of the trees. As the cry went up, the wild creatures quaked, the deer in the dale quithering with dread, hurtled to high ground but were headed off by the ring of beaters who bawled and roared, the stags of the herd with their high-branched heads, and the broad-horned bucks were allowed to pass by, for the lord of the land had laid down a law that man should not maim the male in close season, but the hinds were halted with hollows and whoops, and the din drove the does to sprint for the dells. Then the eye can see that the air is all arrows, all across the forest they flashed and flickered, biting through hides with their broad heads. What? They bleat as they bleed and they die on the banks, and always the hounds are hard on their heels, and the hunters on horseback come hammering behind with stones spitting cries as if cliffs had collapsed. And those animals which escaped the aim of the archers were steered from the slopes down to rivers and streams and set upon and seized the stations below, so perfect and practised were the men at their posts. And so great were the greyhounds which grappled with the deer, that prey was pounced on and dispatched with speed and force. The Lord's heart leaps with life, now on, now off his horse, all day he hacks and drives, and dusk comes in due course. So through a lime-leaf border the Lord led the hunt, while snug in his sheets lay slumbering Gawain, dozing as the daylight dappled the walls, under a splendid cover enclosed by curtains, and while snoozing he heard a slyly made sound. The sigh of a door swinging slowly aside. From below the bedding he brings up his head and lifts the corner of the curtain a little, wondering warily what it might be. It was she, the lady, looking her loveliest, most quietly and craftily closing the door. Nearing the bed, the knight felt nervous. Lying back, he assumed the shape of sleep. As she stole towards him with silent steps, then clasped the curtain and crept inside, then sat down softly at the side of his bed, and awaited him wakening for a good long while. Gawain lay still in his state of false sleep, turning over in his mind 
what this matter might mean, and where the lady's unlikely visit might lead, and yet he said to himself, instead of this stealth, I should ask openly what her actions imply. So he stirred and stretched, turned on his side, lifting his eyelids and looked, looking alarmed, sighed himself hurriedly with his hand as if saving his life. Her chin is pale, her cheeks are ruddy red, her smile is sweet, she speaks with lips which love to laugh. Good morning, Sir Gawain, said the graceful lady. You sleep so soundly one might sidle in here. You're tricked and you're trapped, but let's make a truce, or I'll besiege you in bed, and you'd better believe me. She giggled girlishly as she see teased good Gawain. The man in bed said, Good morning, ma'am. I'll contentedly attend whatever task you set, and in serving your desires I shall seek your mercy which seems my best plan in the circumstances. And he loaded his light-hearted words with laughter. But my gracious lady, if you grant me leave, will you pardon this prisoner and prompt him to rise? Then I'll quit these covers and pull on my clothes, and our words will flow more freely black and forth. Not so, beautiful sir, the sweet lady said. Bide in your bed, my own plan is better. I'll tuck in your corners, cover to cover, then playfully parley with the man I have been. Because I know your name, the knight Sir Gawain, Fame through the realm, whichever he rode, whichever road he rides, whose princely honour is highly praised amongst lords and ladies and everyone else. And right here you lie, and we are left all alone, with my husband and his huntsman away in the hills, and the servants snoring, and my maids asleep, and the door to this bedroom barred with a bolt. I have in my house an honoured guest. So I'll take my time, I'll be talking to him for a while. You're free to have my all, to do with me as you will. I'll come just as you call, and swear to serve you well. In good faith, said Gawain, such gracious flattery. Though in truth, I'm not nearly such a noble knight. I don't dare to receive the respect you describe, and in no way warrant such worthy words. But by God, I'll be glad if you give me the right to serve your desires and with action or speech bring you perfect pleasure. The honour would be priceless, said the gracious lady, Sir Gawain, in good faith. How improper on my part if I were to imply any slur or slight on your status as a knight. But what lady in this land wouldn't latch the door, wouldn't rather hold you as I do here, in the company of your clever conversation, forgetting all grief and engaging in joy, then hug to her heart a hoard of gold. I praise the Lord who upholds the high heavens, for I have what I hoped for above all else by his grace. That lovely looking maid, she charmed him and she chased, but every move she made he counted case by case. Madam, said our man, may Mary bless you. In good faith you are kind and the fairest of the fair. Some fellows are praised for the feats they perform. I hardly deserve to receive such respect, whereas you are genuinely joyful and generous. By Mary, she declared, it's quite the contrary. I were the wealthiest woman in the world, with priceless pearls in my palm of my hand, to bargain with and buy the best of all men. Then, for all signs you have shown me, sir, of kindness, courtesy, and exquisite looks, a picture of perfection now proved to be true. No person on this planet would be picked before you. In fairness, said Gawain, you found far better, but I am proud of the price you would pay from your purse, and I will swear to serve you as my sovereign for ever. Let Christ now know that Gawain is your knight. Then they muse on many things through morning and midday, and the lady stares with a loving look. But Gawain is a gentleman and remains on guard, and although no woman could be warmer or more winning, he is cool in his conduct on account of the scene he foresees, the strike he must receive as cruel fate decrees. The lady begs her leave, at once Gawain agrees. She glanced at him, laughed, and gave her goodbye, then stood and stunned him with astounding words. May the Lord repay you for your prize performance, but I know that Gawain could never be your name. But why not? asked the knight in need of an answer, afraid that some fault in his manners had failed him. The beautiful woman blessed him, then rebuked him. A good man like Gawain, so greatly regarded, the embodiment of corpiness to the bonus of his beings, would 
never have lingered so long with a lady without craving a kiss as politeness requires, or coaxing a kiss with his closing words. Very well, said Gawain, let's do as you wish. If a kiss is your request, I shall keep my promise faithfully to fulfil you, so ask no further. The lady comes close, cradles him in her arms, leans nearer and nearer, then kisses the knight, and they courteously command one another to Christ, and without one more word the woman is away. He leaps from where he lies at a heck of a lick, calls for his chamberlain, chooses his clothes, makes himself ready, then marches off to mass. Then he went to meal, which was made and waiting, and was merry and amused till the moon had silvered the view. No man felt more at home, tucked in between those two, the cute one and the crone, their gladness grew and grew. And the lord of the land still led the hunt, driving hinds to their death through halts and heaths, and by the setting of the sun had slaughtered so many of the does and other deer that it beggared belief. Then finally the folk came flocking to one spot, and quickly they collected and counted the kill. Then the leading lords and their left-hand men chose the finest deer, those fullest with fat, and ordered them cut open by those skilled in the art. They assessed and sized every slain creature, and even on the feeblest found two fingers worth of fat. Through the sliced open throat they seized the stomach, and the butchered innards were bound in a bundle. Next they lopped off the legs and peeled back the pelt, and hooked out the bowels through the broken belly, but carefully, being cautious not to cleave the knot. Then they clasped the throat, and clinically they cut the gullet from the windpipe, and garbaged the guts. Then the shoulder blades were severed with sharp knives, and slotted through a slit so the hide stayed whole. Then the beasts were prized apart at the breast, and they went to work on the rulloching again riveting open the front as far as the hind fork, fetching out the offal then with further purpose, filleting the ribs in a recognised fashion, and the spine was subject to a similar process, being paired to the haunch so it held as one piece, then hoisting it high and hacking it off, and its name is the Numbles as far as I know, and just that, its hind legs prized apart, they slit the fleshy flaps, then cleave and quickly start to break it down its back. Then the heads and necks of hinds were hewn off, and the choice meat of the flanks chopped away from the chine, and the fee for the crows was cast into the coats. Then again each side was skewered, stabbed through the ribs, and heaved up high, hung by its hocks, and each person was paid with appropriate portions, using pelts for plates the dogs pogged out, on liver and lights and stomach linings, and a blended sop of blood and bread. The kill horn was blown, and the bloodhounds bayed, then hauling their meat they headed for home, sounding howling wails on their hunting horns. And as daylight died, they had covered the distance, and were back in the abode where Gawain sat biding his time. Warm friends, warm flames will meet, the huntsman's home return, Gawain as well will greet, his host, bright hearth fires burn. And then the whole of the household was ordered to the hall, and the women as well, with their maids in waiting, and once assembled he instructs the servants that the venison be revealed in view of the crowd, and in excellent ho humour he hollered for Gawain, to see for himself the size of the kill, and showed him the side slabs sliced from the ribs. Are you pleased with this pile? Have I won your praise? Does my skill at this sport deserve your esteem? Why, yes, said the other, it's the hugest haul I've seen out of season for several years, and I give it all to you, Gawain, said the master, for according to our contract it is yours to claim. Just so, said Gawain, and I'll say the same, for whatever I've won within these walls, such gains will be graciously given to you. So he held out his arms and hugged the Lord, and kissed him in the kindliest way he could. You're welcome to my winnings, my one profit, though I gladly have given you any greater prize. I'm grateful, said the Lord, and Gawain, this gift would carry more weight if you dared to, to confess by what wit you won it, and when, and where. That wasn't our pact, he replied, so don't pry. You'll be given nothing greater. The agreement we have holds good. They laugh aloud 
and trade wise words which match their mood. When supper's meal is made, they dine on dainty food. Later they lounged by the Lord's fire, and were served unstintingly with subtle wines, and agreed to the game again next morning, and to play by the rules already in place, any takings to be traded between the two men, at night when they met no matter what the merchandise. They concurred on this contract in front of the court, and drank on the deal, and went on drinking till late, when they took their leave at last and every person present disappeared to bed. By the third cackle of the crowing cock, the lord and his liegemen are leaping from their beds, and mass and the morning meal are taken, and riders are rigged out ready to run as day dawns. They leave the levels loud, with howling hunting horns. The huntsmen lose the hounds, through thickets and through fawns. Um, and it continues uh, with two more hunts, and two more tests of uh, Gawain's sort of um, his honour, uh, but also his his ability to to you know to to not um, uh, be seduced. Um, and uh, on the third night, um, or rather the third day. Uh, the, the poem's not entirely clear, but it's pretty certain that he, he does um, allow himself to be seduced. Um, and he... Um, when when the, um, you know, when the, the, the Lord uh, of the Manor comes back um, to, uh, to... to that evening, um, Gawain basically pretends uh, that he hadn't won anything, um, which is a shame because, you know, in some ways it might be nice if he'd actually kind of, you know, got got, on, got it on with uh, the Lord. But you know, this is not that kind of story. Um, and they're all good friends. It's everything, but but there's something up, and it's all a little bit kind of, you know, we're not quite sure what's going on. And then later on. Uh, at the end of the poem, uh, Gawain meets the Green Knight again um, and uh, offers up his neck uh, for the Green Knight to make his his uh, his his swing, his side of the original bargain. Uh, and the Green Knight swings three times, and the first time Gawain flinches, and um, the Green Knight admo admonishes him for his failure. Um, uh, to be true to himself, uh, which is to say his failure to um, meet adversity head on and to um, be strengthened by it. Uh, the second time uh, Gawain is, um, stands firm and the Green Knight um, pulls his um, uh, pulls his stroke and doesn't um, behead Gawain, uh, uh, but sort of laughs at him. But he, you know, he says, "Well done for doing that, for for actually um, being willing to, you know, to, to, to stand by what you said you were going to do." Um, and then the final uh, stroke, the knight um, just the the green knight just nicks Gawain's head. Uh, or his neck, uh, and doesn't sever it. Um, and Gawain sort of jumps up and says, "That's it. You've had your, um, you've had your attempt to 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 kill me, and you failed. And now I'm going to fight you like a man." Um, and the Green Knight starts laughing and says, um, "Well, that was me taking revenge for the fact that you slept with my wife, basically." Um, uh, and didn't tell me about it. Um, so you've got this thing of defeat comes um, not through um, not through physical defeat. Um, you know, Gawain could have been defeated physically, but he isn't. Um, and if he had been, it would have been a moral victory for him. Um, and this is something that you get in fighting games, and you get in... Well, you don't get in fighting games, because 
the moral the, to, to, to lose is never considered a moral victory. Um, but you do get it in in the kind of you know that sort of Hong Kong cinema, that sort of um, classic uh, stories of basically people fighting um, and um, and losing, but losing heroically. Um, but that's sort of something that that, that isn't really considered is uh, worthwhile um, in Street Fighter. Um, and so you just keep going and. As you can see, here I am keeping going against Saga, even though he's winning. Um, I think this is one of the most interesting fights that I did because I really thought that I was going to lose against Saga. Um, I should mention that because of the technology I've got, um, I have to, I had to um, uh, record the uh, gameplay before I recorded the. Um, uh, you know, before I recorded the sound, um, and yeah, I my plan was to just keep playing until um, until I lost, and then to use that, and then to talk over that. Um, and I really thought I was going to lose against Saga. I mean, as you can see, that last match was particularly close, and I'm not a good Street Fighter player. Um, I'm on the lowest difficulty, or not quite the lowest difficulty. Um, and even then he was um, you know a little bit too good and then you know after that I managed to pull a perfect victory uh, on the second um, fight um, or the third round so you know that's this whole idea that, that there is no noble loss um, in, in a fighting game there is only loss uh, which I think is interesting because I suppose with a fighting game you can always replay it and you can you can build yourself up, you can build your skills up until you can finally defeat Bison, which I can't do here. Uh, as you will see, he defeats me very, very quickly. Um, which is very different to that kind of literary um, thing, which is, you know, there's only one chance. And Gawain fails and he feels that he's failed. Um, but the rest of the knights of the round table decide that they're going to take his failure um, and uh, make a virtue of it. It's quite interesting at the end of the story. They all, you know, he he wears this sash that's given to him by uh, the Lord's wife, uh, who is Morgana Fay, um, and he wears it as a badge of his shame of the fact that he was um, he wasn't virtuous. And the rest of the knights decide to take it on as a badge for themselves to show that no one is ever truly virtuous. No one ever wins every fight. Um, you know, the, the, that, yeah, you lose. Um, the perfect victory that is a... Uh, um, you know that is a um, that is a fighting game, or rather, is is the end of any video game because it, it's sort of you know if you win the game, you're usually showing a continuous perfect version of events, which just doesn't exist.